Tisztelt előadó társaim, tisztelt. Honorable co-presenters, dear guests. Uh, I know that as a defense judge, sometimes we stand up after such delay and we simply say that we agree with what had been said before us. But of course, I'm not going to do that now because it would be disrespectful towards those who are still sitting in the room. And secondly, in certain matters, I also have my own views. And perhaps that uh, unique view or those unique views have a place here uh, on this special occasion today. It is indeed a special occasion because we are analyzing the practical implementation of a piece of legislation. And when we actually discuss the realization of a piece of legislation, that's always exciting. Because perhaps you agree that uh, the, the lawmaker that articulates perceived or real societal needs are different from the views of uh, legal scientists who have a more theoretical approach. And we also have the lawyers who exercise the law in practice. And especially when it comes to a criminal code, it's not simply about uh, practical lawyers having a different approach from the lawmaker or the theoretical experts. But obviously, among those who apply the law, it must be said, and I don't think it's a problem, that the approach of the minister who evaluates the investigation process is certainly different from the prosecutor who represents the who represents the indictment and also the defending judge, who again has a different approach. Uh, because behind the defending judge, there is also something else. There is a central player. There is another component in the room who is the charged. And I must mention Tibor Kirai. Uh, in the near future, we will have a conference dedicated to his memory, but I'd like to quote Tibor Kirai again, who said that in the punitive process, the state has such excessive powers that we had to come up with someone who we could insert into this criminal process so that the charged whose crime will be judged can be supported by someone who will represent the interest of the charged with due bias. So it's this kind of principle we try and follow in our punity processes. And now I'd like to assess the criminal code from this aspect. And of course, as much as we perform the role of the defending judge, uh, of course, uh, it was agreed at the time by all stakeholders that a new criminal code was indeed required because since the adoption of the last substantive act, uh, more than 1,000 modifications have been made to the code, so it was obvious that there was a need for a new code to be introduced. But there was no full agreement, I would say, with the lawmakers that there were a number of points made in the process of preparation that were not reassuring for the defending judges, the defending lawyers. Uh, and also uh, it raised certain thoughts, which says that the strictness of the law, the increasing of punishments, 
and the multiple application of life sentences will put a break to crime and make it clear to all participants of the legal system that Hungary is not a paradise for criminals. And of course, solicitors exercising their profession do not wish Hungary to be a paradise of crime, but when they hear that practically uh, sentences must be tightened up and life sentences must be dished out on a regular basis, while, of course, uh, legal policy has the opportunity to identify such targets, but if they don't leave room for individualization, then, well, it somehow, this thought somehow scares us or scared us. But the good news is that, as everyone knows, the adopted legislation did not finally reflect these principles in their entirety. There was no way that uh, the majority of sentences were made stricter, so the punishments did not increase in severity in general, and uh, the legal institutions that left room for individualization were not excluded from the law. For example, putting a uh, charge on uh, conditional discharge, etc., etc. So the adopted law in this sense, I must say, did not uh, reflect this very strong sentence by the government. And therefore, when the practical application of the criminal code started, and we could see the practice uh, close up in the courtrooms, the core situation appeared to be reassuring. Uh, well, I'd like to highlight one or two issues just very briefly, focusing uh, on potential issues in the process of becoming effective. Of course, I am biased. I'm looking at the situation from the aspect of the defending party and keeping the interest of the charged person in mind. So I think the possibility for individualization is a core issue. As we heard from the previous presentation, uh, being dis conditionally discharged and the tightening of the rules in 2019, well, uh, we must say that uh, it could be done, and legal policy was influenced by a decision of the government. And the reaction that followed a very regrettable case was not really well consulted by stakeholders. So when it comes to conditional discharge, certain culprits were excluded from the potential scope, which eliminates the desired principle that the court should have room for judgment in as many cases as possible to take into consideration the personal consequences of the culprit and the individual characteristics of the case so that they can judge instead of a 10, 15 year old piece of legislation uh, which excludes the possibility of conditional discharge. The other issue I would mention is the obligation to generalize, so to say, which was referred to by Minister Pinter. And as a defense lawyer, uh, I can only confirm, but of course the minister doesn't need me to confirm any statements, but I can nevertheless say that uh, he referred to the fact that and how did he put it? Okay, that the uh, court would only apply uh, these 
possibilities in a very cultured and mature way. Yes, that is true. They always follow the rules by keeping the possibility of individualization in mind, but we have to start the calculation somewhere. So we start from the mid-range to make sure that the punishment dished out is in line with this. However, where I see some minor issues, uh, have been seen some minor issues, is the so-called mid-range. And we are not going uh, into details of this at this conference. I'm just making a quick reference. When it comes to the new criminal code, we still expect a lot from the possibility of concluding the deal in a preparatory stage. And what we have been seeing as defense lawyers recently is that the motions of the prosecutor feel they okay so during the preparatory stage they can make a recommendation so we managed to close a significant number of cases in the preparatory meeting. It might be an issue, uh, but uh, I hope any issues might be resolved at this stage. <coughs> so I'd also like to focus on substantive law from the aspect of a defense lawyer where I see a kind of inflation taking place. But of course, when we mention inflation, we mean something else these days. We are all eating the bitter fruits of the inflationary environment we have. Nevertheless, I'd like to use the term of inflation for two concepts. Criminal gangs and money laundering would be the two concepts. And I'd like to talk about these two legal institutions in just a couple of sentences. And what do I mean by inflation in these two areas? When I speak about criminal gangs or organizations, of course, uh, it's not a mistake that there are more grave circumstances to crimes committed in groups. That's right as it is. So uh, it's right that uh, criminal organizations are also added as a concept to criminal associations. And it's also acceptable that there are grave legal consequences for crimes uh, committed in groups. But I am biased as a defense lawyer when I am saying that maybe they went a little bit too far and to threaten uh, someone for budgetary uh, offenses with a custodial sentence of between two to eight years. And of course, if it's a repeat offense and if it's a criminal gang, then the upper limit of the custodial sentence might go up to go up to 24 years. And when you see that, you start wondering whether uh, if a c crime committed as part of a criminal gang is indeed justified to be hit by such uh, heavy sentences. And of course, it's very easy to have repeat crimes in certain situations, and then suddenly you have a 24-year custodial sentence. And of course, if that concept is inflated or depreciated, and uh, a criminal gang crime is established in cases where it uh, as I can clearly hear, goes against the original will of the lawmaker. So when that happens, you cannot uh, wonder why the lawmaker said in 2019 that the code must be modified. And when it comes to the justification of the new code, well, uh, there is something I'd like to quote. Uh, I don't often read such sentences in the justification of criminal, the criminal gang part of the law. Uh, the current practice, it says, 
uh, destroys the intentions of the law because it doesn't differentiate between the different stakeholders and therefore modification has become necessary. In another place, it says that this practice actually dampened down the concept of criminal gangs, said the lawmaker. And uh, of course, I'm not going to quote the law in detail. And with all due respect, I must say that the court had this feeling that something had to be done, and especially uh, when it comes to the reasoning and the general uh, judicial practice cause for a res called for a response and therefore not long later a precedent ruling was issued by the courier which starts with the following sentence changes in the provision of law does not necessarily mean that the concept of criminal gangs, criminal organizations has been rethought or reconsidered by the lawmakers. And there were also some one-off judgments passed where it would still appear that the court, and please allow me to stick to the type of crime that practically dominated economic crime, because next to budgetary crime, another classical type of economic uh, fraud is, is what we have at hand. So in these cases, we typically have an executive director, an accountant, a finance employee. They have been working together for 20 years, and then they commit budgetary crime. Well, in such situations, these are indeed criminal gangs, and this sentence will be established against members of a criminal gang. And it might appear, I'm saying it as a defense lawyer, that uh, the will of the uh, lawmaker does not actually get through. and. Uh, we might need to change the judicial practice in a way whereby the lawmaker also needs to be involved. And last but not least, as I said before, I can see this depreciation uh, for another term as well, which is money laundering. And of course, here we should look beyond the borders of the country. Uh, we are delayed, so I'm not going to go back in legal history to give you an overview. It wouldn't make sense. But we know, of course, that the whole thing started from the international fight against uh, international terrorism. So the world had to start fighting international terrorism, where there are international organizations involved that committed serious crimes against life. So the fight against money laundering started. And how far did the fight against money laundering get? If you look at the effective criminal code, there is no such crime as criminal custody. Uh, it was included in the code, and uh, if you have to explain to someone that if they purchase a stolen iPad that qualifies as money laundering, then it's good to have a colleague who can explain the reasons why they will be sentenced on money laundering. And there are certain anomalies in here. And where I'd like to get to is that uh, I am again quoting the law, which makes it clear that any crime committed against um, 
well, okay, the utilization of stolen goods or the purchasing of stolen goods should qualify as money laundering was something no one wanted in the EU. And of course, uh, the different languages use different terms for this and how they can be transposed into logo, local legal practices is a, is a tough matter. But when we see that a judgment as a result of real budgetary crime well actually defines the payment of dividends from this increased income as money laundering then i really shrivel and i think so how is that so you cannot really commit a crime, a budgetary crime in itself, because, of course, uh, it's difficult to imagine that someone commits budgetary crime uh, without um, ultimate objective or benefiting from it. So if we get to this stage, then, of course, we need to go back to the lawmaker or the curia needs to apply legal unification not just a one-off uh, judgment of precedent value and somehow sort out the judicial practice. Honorable colleagues, honorable attendants to the conference, at the beginning of my address, I already indicated that I'm going to discuss matters from the aspect of a defense lawyers, matters that will hopefully not spoil the celebration today, and hopefully we cannot spoil the mood by raising problematic issues and saying that, okay, the next years are still ahead of us and we should find a solution to these matters. And if we once again organize a conference on the criminal law in 10 years' time, then there the problematic issues that I or others raised can be addressed again. And perhaps in 10 years' time, we can also say again that uh, a custodial sentence as the capital form of punishment perhaps could be replaced by something else in a modern state to make sure we don't have so many convicts in the prison system. Uh, but perhaps the chapter of the criminal law which identifies alternative punishments as opposed to custodial sentences should be broadened to lighten the burden on the prison sentence, and I think that would be the right direction for society in general as well. Thank you for your attention.